Today, we're going to start off with a live performance by Tony Ballard and Daryl King from Port Ritchie, Florida, which will be followed by a quote from Abdu'l-Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, and a quote from Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. <laughs> How vast is the tabernacle of the cause of God. It hath overshadowed all the peoples and kindreds of the earth, and will ere long gather together the whole of mankind beneath its shelter. The day of service is now come. Arise for the triumph of my cause. And through the power of thine utterance, subdue the hearts of men. Thou must show forth that which will ensure the peace and the well-being of the miserable and the downtrodden. Let your vision be world embracing. Let your vision be world embracing. Let your vision be world embracing. result 
and strife and ruin. We beseech God that he may shield his creatures from the evil designs of his enemies. He verily hath power over all things. Let your vision be a world embracing. Let your vision be a world embracing. Let your vision be a world embracing. Watch over yourselves, for the evil one is lying in wait, ready to entrap you. Gird yourselves against his wicked devices, and led by the light of the name of the all-seeing God, make your escape from the darkness that surrounded you. Let your vision be world-embracing, rather than confined to your own self. These are the words of Baha'u'llah. To be a Baha'i simply means to love all the world, to love humanity and try to serve it, to work for universal peace and universal brotherhood. Abdu Baha. <clears throat> every age hath its own problem and every soul its particular aspiration. The remedy the world needeth in its present day afflictions can never be the same as that which a subsequent age may require. Be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age ye live in and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. Baha'u'llah. Thank you so much. So now I'll introduce our speaker for today. And just a reminder to please save all your questions until after the talk when we'll have our Q&A session. And if you're new to the Baha'i Faith or if you'd like to be added to our mailing list, please fill out the Google form that we'll put in the chat below. Our speaker this week is Ms. Pamana Parhami, and her topic is, Should Religion Be Hereditary or Chosen? A Baha'i Perspective. Pamana Parhami is an attorney at Kilpatrick Townsend and Stockton LLP, an international law firm well known for its cutting edge and robust intellectual property practice. Pamana practices trademark and copyright law with the firm's San Francisco office. She is a graduate of Berkeley Law School with a certificate in law and technology. Pamana graduated cum laude from Barnard College of Columbia University, earning a Bachelor of Arts degree with honors in political science and a minor in chemistry. Between college and law school, Pamana volunteered at the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel for one year as the administrative assistant of the Department of Security. Pamana hopes to use her law degree as a tool to follow Baha'u'llah's admonition to quote, be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age ye live in and center your deliberation on its exigencies and requirements. And with that, I'll hand it off to Pamana. Thank you, Bayan, for that introduction. And thank you to our musicians also for that beautiful um, piece this morning. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. So as Bayan said, the topic of my talk today is something I think is really important. Um, and it's whether religion should be hereditary or chosen. Um, this seems like a very basic question and it seems like 
the answer would be obvious, but we've seen that throughout history, uh, religion has been largely a, a hereditary decision. So I first want to start off with a quick overview of what the Baha'i Faith is, in case this is the first time you're hearing about it. Um, so the Baha'i Faith is a world religion that essentially em emphasizes the essential worth of all religions and the unity of all people. It was established by Baha'u'llah, who Baha'is believe is the promised one of all ages, and he revealed his revelation and mission in the 19th century in Persia. So one of the fundamental things Baha'u'llah taught us is that God has sent to humanity a series of divine educators who we call manifestations of God. They're also called messengers or prophets of God. And they come periodically throughout time and provide teachings to serve as the basis of the advancement of civilization. And these teachings um, are updated to align with the social realities of each time. Um, these sorts of, you know, when I refer to manifestations of God, I'm referring to those great figures such as Abraham, Krishna, Zoroaster, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad. And Baha'u'llah, who's the latest of these messengers, explained that all these religions come from the same source, and they're essentially like successive chapters of one religion of God. So Baha'i's essential purpose is to find a unifying vision of the future of society and also of the nature and purpose of life. And this vision we find in the writings of Baha'u'llah. So going to this concept of progressive revelation, and when I refer to that concept, I'm referring to the idea that these messengers of God come throughout history at different periods of time. Um, this concept kind of underlies Baha'i's understanding of what, what the purpose of religion is and why it should be a choice. So if we look at the history of religion, we see it's, it's always been a hereditary decision. Every time a manifestation of God comes to the world, there's never been overwhelming acceptance. In fact, it's been overwhelming rejection and persecution. And we see this pattern of constant uh, rejection, humiliation, and degradation of the messengers of God. And, and each time they come, really only a handful of people follow them. Only a handful of people choose to break free from their forefathers, their families, and the previous practices and religions of their community. So we have to think, what would happen if we were alive in these time periods? If we were alive when Jesus came, would we recognize him? Would we be one of those very few people who would break free from, from tradition and from dogma? It, it's very unlikely. Like I said, there is this pattern of rejection. And so if we, if we think we ourselves would not recognize the manifestation of God, we have to think about why. Um, you know, it's funny because most of us don't even let our parents pick what we should wear or where we should go or who we should be friends with, but yet we let them choose the most important thing, which is our spiritual destiny, which lasts for eternity. So one of the really important principles of the Baha'i faith is the independent investigation of truth. And this means that each individual is responsible for their own spiritual destiny. And Baha'u'llah has completely abolished the role of clergy or religious leaders who kind of tell their followers what they should think and what the correct interpretation of the holy books are. Baha'u'llah has completely um, abrogated that role and given the responsibility of deciding up to each individual. Um, so for example, in the Baha'i faith, the way someone becomes a Baha'i is at the age of 15, um, they decide on their own because that is considered the age of spiritual maturity. So that youth has to read, investigate all the world's religions and understand and choose for themselves what they want their spiritual destiny to be. So why is it that we can't look towards religious leaders to help guide us? I mean, religious leaders spend their times, you know, immersed in the holy books and they spend their lives dedicated to this. So wouldn't it be, you know, a good idea to at least get input and guidance from our religious leaders? Well, actually, historically, religious leaders have not only not helped people recognize the manifestation of God, but they've actually been a huge obstacle. Um, and Baha'u'llah explains multiple reasons for this, but some of them are power, lust for status, lack of clear authority from God. Many of these re religious leaders were not actually appointed or designated by the manifestation of God themselves. Um, in the Book of Certitude, Baha'u'llah writes, leaders of religion in every age have hindered their people from attaining the shores of eternal salvation inasmuch as they held the reins of authority in their mighty grasp. Some for the lust of leadership, others through want of knowledge and understanding, 
have been the cause of the deprivation of the people. By their sanction and authority, every prophet of God hath drunk from the chalice of sacrifice and winged his flight unto the heights of glory. What unspeakable cruelties they that have occupied the seats of authority and learning have inflicted upon the true monarchs of the world, those gems of divine virtue. Content with a transitory dominion, they have deprived themselves of an everlasting sovereignty. And then Baha'u'llah goes on to explain some of the reasons for this denial. He says, the denials and protestations of these leaders of religion have in the main been due to their lack of knowledge and understanding. Those words uttered by the revealers of the beauty of the one true God, setting forth the signs that should herald the advent of the manifestation to come, they never understood nor fathomed. Hence, they raised the standard of revolt and stirred up mischief and sedition. It is obvious and manifest that the true meaning of the utterances of the birds of eternity is revealed to none except those that manifest the eternal being. And the melodies of the nightingale of holiness can reach no ear save that of the denizens of the everlasting realm. So we see that Baha'u'llah is explaining that it doesn't matter if, if you were appointed with you know, that title of a religious leader or you assume that role, the only people that can understand the coming of the new manifestation are those people who have a receptive ear. So what does it mean to be re receptive? And like I said, if there's been such a pattern of rejection, how is it that we can ever come to recognize a new manifestation of God? And what qualities and attitudes do we need to have to do that? So Abdul Baha, who is the son of Baha'u'llah and his authorized interpreter, he gave this talk in Paris in 1912. And it's, it's a short talk. I just wanted to read it. And then it really struck me as interesting, a lot of the parts of it. So I wanted to break it down after that. So this talk is called The Search After Truth. If a man would succeed in his search after truth, he must in the first place shut his eyes to all the traditional superstitions of the past. The Jews have traditional superstitions. The Buddhists and the Zoroastrians are not free from them. Neither are the Christians. All religions have gradually become bound by tradition and dogma. All consider themselves respectively the only guardians of the truth and that every other religion is composed of errors. They themselves are right, all others are wrong. The Jews believe that they are the only possessors of the truth and condemn all other religions. The Christians affirm that their religion is the only true one, that all others are false. Likewise, the Buddhists and Mohammedans all limit themselves. If all condemn one another, where shall we search for truth? All contradicting one another, all cannot be true. If each believe his particular religion to be the only true one, he blinds his eyes to the truth in the others. If, for instance, a Jew is bound by the external practice of the religion of Israel, he does not permit himself to perceive that truth can exist in any other religion. It must be all contained in his own. We should, therefore, detach ourselves from the external forms and practices of religion. We must realize that these forms and practices, however beautiful, are but garments clothing the warm heart and the living limbs of divine truth. We must abandon the prejudices of tradition if we would succeed in finding the truth at the core of all religions. If a Zoroastrian believes that the sun is God, how can he be united to other religions? While idolaters believe in their various idols, how can they understand the oneness of God? It is therefore clear that in order to make any progress in the search after truth, we must relinquish superstition. If all seekers would follow this principle, they would obtain a clear vision of truth. If five people meet together to seek for truth, they must begin by cutting themselves free from all their own special conditions and renouncing all preconce preconceived ideas. In order to find truth, we must give up our prejudices, our own small trivial notions. An open receptive mind is essential. If our chalice is full of self, there is no room in it for the water of life. The fact that we imagine ourselves to be right and everybody else wrong is the greatest of all obstacles in the path towards unity. And unity is necessary if we would reach truth, for truth is one. Therefore, it is imperative that we should renounce our own particular prejudices and superstitions if we earnestly desire to seek the truth. 
Unless we make a distinction in our minds between dogma, superstition, and prejudice on the one hand, and truth on the other, we cannot succeed. When we are earnest in our search for anything, we look for it everywhere. This principle we must carry out in our search for truth. Science must be accepted. No one truth can contradict another truth. Light is good in whatsoever lamp it is burning. A rose is beautiful in whatsoever garden it may bloom. A star has the same radiance if it shines from the east or from the west. Be free from prejudice. So will you love the sun of truth from whatsoever point in the horizon it may arise. You will realize that if the divine light of truth shone in Jesus Christ, it also shone in Moses and in Buddha. The earnest seeker will arrive at this truth. This is what is meant by the search after truth. It means also that we must be willing to clear away all that we have previously learned, all that would clog our steps on the way to truth. We must not shrink, if necessary, from beginning our education all over again. We must not allow our love for any one religion or any one personality to so blind our eyes that we become fettered by superstition. When we are freed from all these bonds, seeking with liberated minds, then shall we be able to arrive at our goal. Seek the truth, the truth shall make you free. So shall we see the truth in all religions, for truth is in all and truth is one. So there were many aspects of, of this talk I found really interesting, really insightful, and I just wanted to go through some of them. The first is, Abdul Baha says, if a man would succeed in his search after truth, he must, in the first place, shut his eyes to all the traditional superstitions of the past. So what does it mean to have a superstition? Um, I think no one is going to go around and self-identify as a superstitious person. I mean, if you go up to someone and say, are you superstitious? They're going to say no, right? But at the same time, we know that superstition exists and we can probably think of, you know, groups or people that we would consider to be superstitious, but yet no one would say that about themselves. So what, what, what really is superstition then? <clears throat> well, Merriam-Webster defines it as a few things. The first, it's a belief or practice, <clears throat> a belief or practice resulting from ignorance, fear of the unknown, trust in magic or chance, or a false conception of causation. So the second is, um, it's an irrational abject attitude of mind toward the supernatural nature or God resulting from superstition. And the third is, it's a notion maintained despite evidence to the contrary. So the first one is interesting because it's a belief or practice resulting from ignorance or fear of the unknown. These are some reasons that Baha'u'llah referred to in the Book of Certitude, that passage I read earlier, um, where he said fear and also ignorance, just lack of understanding, led to a lot of the, the rejection of the new manifestations. So we know that fear of the unknown is actually a, a huge barrier, probably the most primary barrier to change in all aspects of our lives. Usually the reason we're resistant to change is because we fear what we haven't experienced. I mean, human beings are very um, data-driven and experiential creatures. We like to know what's happened. We like to take paths that others have taken before. We know what the outcomes are and what we can expect and how we can prepare. So we're scared to do things differently. I mean, even um, on the micro level in our own lives, um, when someone changes careers, that's seen as, as a huge change, a huge um, going out on a limb, even moving cities, making a whole new group of friends. All these things are, are scary and they require a lot of courage. So now imagine changing our religion, which for many people has served as the foundation of their life. It's provided a framework from which they can see the world. Um, and so this is a very scary thing. Um, actually, my great-great-grandfather, <clears throat> Sayyid Mustafa, he was the Imam Jome of Simnan, and this means that he was the chief cleric, uh, Muslim cleric of Simnan, and he eventually um, learned about the Baha'i faith and accepted it, and this means he had to give up his entire livelihood. I mean, his entire livelihood was his role as this cleric, so it is possible, and in the history of the Baha'i revelation, there have been people with very high statuses in society who have given that up to accept this revelation and they've chosen a completely new path and especially in a society like Iran where religion really forms the foundation of society. But in this process we are finding our spiritual calling which is it is worth giving up these other things we've been attached to. 
And the, the other definition of superstition, which is a notion maintained despite evidence to the contrary, this is interesting because it kind of relates to the idea of confirmation bias, which we know a lot of people, mo most people actually, science has shown, when they are taking in new information, they're not doing it to learn or to change their point of view. Really, the way we take in information is to fit it into our own framework and the own, our own way we see the world. And this is why discourse and, and conversation and understanding is so difficult. Um, so here we see superstition. It's not like all this, you know, we usually identify superstition with like magic or like weird, crazy things. But really, it's just a notion that you maintain despite getting evidence to the contrary. So, you know, these religious leaders and humanity in the past, they have gotten evidence according to the holy books that this new manifestation of God is from God. And they've chosen, you know, a, a worldview completely opposite to that. Not only do they not believe in the manifestation, but they label him as a, as a heretic, as blasphemous, as a danger to society, and they persecute him. So this is what we mean by superstition. <clears throat> and the second thing I found interesting about Abdul Baha's talk is he said that all religions have gradually become bound by tradition and dogma. So I think one natural question would be, well, if all religions have gradually become bound by tradition, won't this happen to the Baha'i faith? I mean, the whole reason something is a pattern is because patterns repeat themselves, right? So what makes the Baha'i faith any different? Well, I think there's two things here. The first is that in, in previous uh, religions, the independent search after truth was not an ideal that was emphasized. In fact, it was not really possible for a large portion of human history. L literacy rates were extremely low. I mean, only a few rich people could even afford to know how to read and understand things. And also religion was more of a, a community-based endeavor and it was more um, creating a system of norms and values that people could share. And the whole independent aspect of it wasn't really emphasized. But like I said, in this revelation, Baha'u'llah has emphasized the in importance of the individual seeking that truth for himself and rejecting you know, any sort of uh, clergy or class of people who claim to know more. And I think the second thing is that eventually Baha'is believe that there will be a new manifestation of God, even after Baha'u'llah. Um, around every 1,000 years, Baha'u'llah has told us a new manifestation of God comes. So if the next manifestation of God comes and people don't recognize him and are so attached to the, the practices and the traditions that they've built up, then I would say yes the Baha'i faith also could fall into that. And so Baha'is don't believe Baha'u'llah is the only manifestation of God, the only correct one, but we believe he's the one for this, this day and age, and his teachings are, are relevant to this particular social needs we're going through today. Um, because when the manifestation of God comes, he provides sort of this reinvigorating force in society. Um, we know that, you know, in nature, we have four seasons, and, you know, the earth goes through this period of renewal in the spring, and it's likewise in the, in, in the realm of the spiritual realities, where every, every so often, humanity is in need of a new burst of spiritual energy released into the world. And this spiritual energy is released when a new manifestation of God comes. But this period of Baha'u'llah's revelation is, is the ultimate <clears throat> pinnacle of, of that reinvigoration. It's the, the highest level of this new spiritual energy we've ever seen in human history. Baha'u'llah says, this is the day in which God's most excellent favors have been poured out upon men. The day in which his most mighty grace hath been infused into all created things. It is incumbent upon all the peoples of the world to reconcile their differences and with perfect unity and peace abide beneath the shadow of the tree of his care and loving kindness. It behooveth them to cleave to whatsoever will in this day be conducive to the exaltation of their stations and to the promotion of their best interests. Happy are those whom the all-glorious pen was moved to remember, and blessed are those men whose names, by virtue of our inscrutable decree, we have preferred to conceal. So we see that this period of time is, is a time when the most potent energy of God has been released in the world, and that's what's so exciting about this, this revelation. This concept of, of renewal is, is really important, and we know it from, you know, organizations or even companies we work at. <clears throat> we know that every organization has to find a balance between stability and change. So if there's not enough change, things become stagnant and outdated. 
But if there's too much change, things become chaotic and unpredictable. So imagine if your company came tomorrow and told you, you know what, we've decided that over the next hundred years, we're going to just keep our salary rates the same. Um, or, you know, over the next hundred years, we're not going to update any of our technology. You can just use the laptop or computer you have right now. Um, or, you know, we're never going to install any new security updates. We're not going to ever give any more training to our employees, um, so on and so forth. <laughs> so obviously this would be ridiculous. And this organization would soon become inefficient. And even I would say after a period of time, it would actually become harmful and detrimental both to its employees and to the outside world. But of course, if your company also, on the other hand, came and said, you know what, every week we're going to change your job responsibilities or, you know, every week you're going to have to learn new software or a, a new workflow system or something like that. That would be, you know, really chaotic and you wouldn't be able to learn and sustain and build like institutional and organizational knowledge. So. If this is true, and we can obviously understand this concept in the work context, how much more important is this in the spiritual context where, you know, the spirituality is, is the foundation of the advancement of civilization. So obviously we do need renewal, of course, or else, you know, things won't align with the realities of the day and age. Um, another thing Abdul Baha brings up is that he says, we need to detach ourselves from the external forms and practices of religion. So I think this is, this is interesting because a lot of times in society, we, we think of religion as, as those external forms and practices. That's just synonymous. Religion is getting up and going to church every Sunday, or it's, you know, um, saying this prayer at this certain time, or, you know, gathering with this certain group of people, or like wearing a certain thing. You know, when you, when you think of religion, I think a lot of times people think of that. But Abdul Baha here is saying religion is like clothing. It's, it's beautiful. It's, uh, it's, a wonderful garment, you know, we, we like our clothes, but would we say, oh yes, I am my shirt. That's, that's what I am. No, of course we like it. It adds value to our life. It's, it's beautiful and it's aesthetically pleasing, but it's not the, the essence of ourselves. And the same thing with religion. So then this, I found really interesting, this, this statement by Abdul Baha. He says, the fact that we imagine ourselves to be right and everybody else wrong is the greatest of all obstacles in the path towards unity. And unity is necessary if we would reach truth, for truth is one. So let's break that down. The first, the first thing in this statement is that the fact that we imagine ourselves to be right and others wrong is the greatest obstacle to unity. So we know this is so true. And we know that most times we think we're right, obviously. I mean, let's say we're walking into a meeting at work or meeting into a, you know, a gathering with friends and we, we kind of know the topic in advance. And we've kind of prepared what our point of view is and things we want to get across. And we obviously think we're right. I mean, how, how often do people go in saying, you know what, I think I'm totally wrong, or I think I'm totally off base here. I think I'm going to listen to what others have to say. I mean, that's very rare. <laughs> we usually think we're right, regardless of if we actually are or not. Um, it's funny because uh, a couple of years ago, I was preparing to meet with someone in like a professional context. And the day before I was trying to prepare and think of, you know, what they might say and what the points I wanted to bring up. And then I kind of got into the spiral of like, what if they say this? And then I say this and they don't like my answer. And then, but what if they tell me this and that? And I was talking to one of my friends and my friend said, well, you could also just approach it like a normal conversation. Like you could just go in there hoping to gain new information and whatever this person tells you, you can actually use that to change your perspective, like organically in the moment. Um, that that can be the, the whole goal of the meeting. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess it could. I mean, it never occurred to me that, <laughs> you know, the whole goal of, a, of an encounter with another human being could be to actually just learn new things and base your new decision making off of that. Um, and this, the second part of this statement by Abdul Baha says, um, unity is necessary if we would reach truth. So I think that's interesting. If unity is necessary to reach truth, doesn't this go against the whole concept of independent investigation of truth that, that I was just talking about? I mean, if we need unity and consensus to even reach the truth, that, that kind of goes against everything that we were talking about because in the past, that's what it was. It was clinging onto your community's version of what the truth was. But Abdul Baha goes on to say that unity is necessary if we would reach truth for truth is one. So the, the concept that truth is one is a fundamental one in the Baha'i faith. So why, why is truth one? Well, because there is one God who's created the entirety of creation, 
And we're all bound by the same spiritual realities and we all belong to the same source of energy. Um, in the physical world, we know this is true. We're all bound by gravity. Nobody can escape that. No matter how much money or access to resources or power they have, nobody can escape the law of gravity. Um, and it's the same in the spiritual realm. There are certain laws and things that are true that none of us can escape. But the fact that there's one truth, um, this, this could be seen as, oh, well, that just means everyone has to think the same thing or everyone has to have the same viewpoint. Um, but no, I, I don't think that's true. This, this just means that the essence of a matter will always have a, a correct outcome. And it's our job to find that correct outcome. And we're, we're all coming at it independently and individually, but we'll always reach that same point of oneness. The next thing I found interesting is that Abdul Baha said, when we are earnest in our search for anything, we look for it everywhere. So, I mean, this is so true. Imagine we really are looking for a job. Like we really want a job. We haven't had a job in a while. We need to pay our bills. Would we just go to one company, give our application, and then just go home and be like, well, let's see what happens, I guess. I mean, just wait and see. If it's meant to be, it'll be. No, obviously not. We would go to a bunch of companies. We would apply. We would network. We would exhaust all our options. And we would look. We would look for a job. That's why it's called the job search. Um, the same thing when, you know, some people have chronic medical problems that, that they're not able to get a diagnosis for. These people, they don't just go to one doctor and the doctor says, yeah, I'm sorry, we, we can't really understand what's going on here. The person doesn't just go home and say, okay, well, I guess I'll just have to live with this for the rest of my life. No, I mean, they go to get second, third, fourth opinion. They do research. They, they, they consult with other people. So the point is that when we want to find something, we look for it. We actively search for it. And Abdul Baha says we have to carry this principle out in our search for truth. So how many of us actually search for truth, actually go out and seek it proactively? I think at best, we're just slightly open to hearing the truth. You know, like we think, okay, well, I'm going to talk to this person or I'm going to go into this situation and maybe they can persuade me. We'll, we'll see if they have some good things to say. Maybe I might change my mind a little bit, right? We're, we're on the passive end of it. We're like kind of just waiting to see what, what happens to us. But like I said, we wouldn't do that in a job search. We wouldn't just sit back and be like, let's, let's see what companies approach me. Let's just see. No, we would proactively be searching for it. So then this, this brings us to this point where Abu Baha says, light is good in whatsoever lamp it is burning. A rose is beautiful in whatsoever garden it may bloom. And then he tells us that if we understand this concept, this will really lead to the elimination of prejudice. So I think this... This goes against the concept of, you know, oh, one truth means that we all have to be the same. No, in fact, it means that one truth means that this same oneness is apparent in the whole of creation. And that, you know, once we understand that we all come from the same source, we can, we can love and appreciate the differences among people. Then Abdul Baha says that the search after truth also means that we must be willing to clear away all that we have previously learned. And then he says, we must not shrink, if necessary, from beginning our education all over again. So this concept of knowledge, um, Baha'u'llah brings us up a lot in the Baha'i writings. And he says that, you know, attaining knowledge and attaining both worldly and spiritual knowledge is a very highly meritorious act. And we should strive for excellence in all endeavors in our life. But he also says that knowledge can become a barrier. Um, it can become a barrier to spiritual faith. And here, Abdul Baha is saying knowledge can just be a barrier to more knowledge. Um, again, in, in the work context, we know that we always have to be staying up to date with, with new developments that happen. We can't just say, you know, this at this point in my life, I've learned everything there is to learn, and I'm just not going to learn anymore. This would actually become an impediment to, to gaining new knowledge, right? And so it's the same way with, with, with spirituality. We, and he says we shouldn't even be scared of having to start all over again. Everything we knew, what we thought we knew, we might have to just go back to the beginning and really examine why, why do we have these beliefs? Why, why are we attached to these specific practices? Why do we think this is the way we want our life to be? And he says, we must not allow our love for any one religion or any one personality to so blind our eyes that we become fettered by superstition. So it's interesting because before we talked about superstition as based in fear or ignorance, but here, Abdul Baha is saying even love, even love for someone, which is the most noble thing to do, right? To love a person or to love a religion, even love can become a barrier. 
Because if we're so attached to this one particular form of God, right, maybe this one messenger manifestation that we really identify with or one set of practices that, that we love and we know, even this love can become a barrier. And so then Abdul Baha tells us that if we seek the truth, the truth shall set us free. And that we must see the truth in all religions, for truth is in all and truth is one. So once we reach this final step of seeing all religions as emanating from one source, one God, and of course, God can have different names or labels or ways of understanding in different traditions and cultures, but there is one God. Once we understand this concept, this actually will free us to realize that we don't need to cling to what our forefathers and parents and ancestors have believed. We don't need to follow the same path because this one God, this essence is present in all the successive religions of God. And we can be open to the fact that God does come back periodically in new manifestations. And it, then it's our job to discern and investigate what is, what is the manifestation of God for this day? What are the needs society is facing? And which revelation fulfills all these prophecies of the past? And if we approach it with this spirit of true inquiry, true curiosity, and beyond that, we are actively searching to find out what is the correct um, the way I want my life to be, what, what are the principles I want to adhere to, and what is the manifestation of God that really speaks to what is going on in the world today. This freedom will allow us to make a choice. And, you know, choosing a religion, choosing to become a Baha'i, for example, it, it doesn't mean that you're rejecting the religions of the past. It means that you're recognizing that same truth that, that you love and you respect in other religions has come back in a new form that's aligned and responsive to the needs of the present world. So with that choice comes freedom because we know that what distinguishes us from animals is really our ability to make a choice, to choose to reject instinct, for example. We don't have to drink water or eat the second we're hungry or thirsty. We don't have to follow what everyone's done before and we can reject habit and you know routines. Animals can't do this. This is exactly what makes us humans. And so, with that choice and with that ability to make, make our own spiritual destiny, this is what really makes us human. So thank you and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much for your talk, Peona. I really liked how in-depth you went into the uh, Paris talk by Abdul Baha. I think it was really helpful for me to understand it when someone breaks it down like that. Um, so yeah, now we can have a Q&A portion. So if you have a question, you can put it in the chat and I will read it out loud. So we have a question from Padia and she asks, how can people reconcile changing their religion while staying true to their existing cultures or traditions? I think that's an interesting question because like I said, um, religion for many is, it's, it's a lifestyle. It's not just a, a set of beliefs. It's, it's the practices and norms that you're used to within your family and your community. And it can be really scary and jarring to change that. Um, I think people can change their religion and still maintain their own traditional cultures. I mean, I know a lot of cultures have beautiful practices and, and beautiful rituals that you do with your family. And there's no reason that, that you need to give up those things. But I mean, I think if we, if we truly understand religion as, as a spiritual reality, not just a external forms and practices, then we would not hesitate to make this choice to choose the religion that we believe aligns with, with the needs of the world. And I think you can still keep your own, you know, families, heritage and traditions in place as well. Our next question asks, how do you determine if a religion is true? Because there are many claims out there. Well, um, like I said, this, this requires actually reading and understanding the holy books of the past. Um, and if, if you're already, if you already belong or identify with a religion, you can read the holy book of your religion. You can read the Bible. And there are many prophecies alluding to the, the, the coming of the next manifestation of God. And there are, there are many great books you can go to that help explain you know these different prophecies and you can read the prophecies and understand that there's a lot of mathematical things that go into it of the year when the next manifestation of god will come and what qualities and attributes will he have um and so every holy book has these prophecies um but it requires you know serious deliberation and understanding and if people want resources for like books that help explain these different prophecies i can i can share that later thank you Um, our next question asks, how can our questions propel the search after truth? 
That's a good question. Um, how can our questions? Well, I mean, our questions should be phrased, or I mean, the questions that we that we allow to guide us should be true questions. I mean, because sometimes, we, you know, we ask ourselves things in a way that's like a leading question, or it's not really like an open ended question. Um, you know, for example, like, in, in the legal context, if you're asking a witness, you know, isn't it true that you were here on this day and time? That, that's a leading question. You're, you're not actually looking to understand where they were at that day or time. You're just trying to, you know, kind of push them into that corner of admitting, yes, they were there. So, you know, our, our questions have to be open-ended. And, you know, for example, if we're approaching or learning about a new religion, instead of asking ourselves, like, is this even valid? Is this even, isn't this crazy? Or, I mean, how could it be that, you know, Jesus would come back in such a different form? Or, I mean, how could it be possible, right? And these questions have this underlying connotation of, you know, disbelief or, or, or negativity or things that can act as barriers. But I think if our questions are truly, you know, what, what should the next manifestation of God do? What, what should they bring to humanity? What, what purpose should they serve? I think even those fundamental questions, we don't ask ourselves. I don't think there's a lot of Christians who go, what, what will the next manifestation of God look like? Right. I mean, the whole concept of being Christian is oriented around Jesus. Right. And that's that's beautiful and that's amazing. But Jesus taught us that he will come again. And he says, I will return again unto you like a thief in the night. And so if someone's coming like a thief in the night, this is not going to be a an open trumpets blaring and things falling from the sky. This is going to be something that's that requires your own investigation. So I think even just approaching, you know, your search after truth with those fundamental questions are really important. Thank you. So now we have a question from Ethan. So I'm going to unmute him. Hello, boy, everybody. Uh, well, I'm new in Baha'i faith since 2019. I heard first time about uh, Baha'iism, about Baha'i faith. And in 2020, I completely believed on Hazrat Baha'u'llah. Uh, and uh, all and all the uh, holy words uh, uh, but there are some questions in my mind that what is what is our belief uh, about previous religions uh, like uh, after when uh, when Baula says that he is the promised one after 19 years uh, ago uh, somebody claimed in India that he is also a promised one but uh, uh, as a Baha'i, we don't believe on it because uh, according to Baha'i faith, uh, Baha'i faith is a time circle for upcoming 1000 years, right? So uh, when, when we read, so I want to know what is our belief about uh, previous religions, about previous books, because uh, like uh, uh, there is in, 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 a, in a Bible, I read in the chapter of Matthew that Jesus says that uh, and Jesus is not came to uh, deny the previous one. He came to, uh, you know, our, our word uh, is a takmil uh, to to complete uh, to to complete the uh, you know all all the system and all the circle, uh, but never shows that uh, uh, someone also came in the future. And in a, a Muslim in a Muslim says, and there are a lot of. Uh, in Muslim books, it is clearly mentioned that uh, Muhammad says that mm -hmm. he is the lost one and nobody came after him. So, uh, but you know, when I ask this question from Baha'i people, there's uh, why, why God needs to send uh, more messengers and more prophets in, in lost uh, one or two centuries. So, and this says that uh, we don't deny uh, the preaching of a uh, Jesus because and also don't deny the mm, preaching of Muhammad, don't deny the mm, and preaching of David and, and so on. And those preaching are for a specific certain time period. Uh, when the time period, a new, when a new time period came, so we need a new preaching. That's why God sent uh, Abdul Baha uh, and uh, uh, a new Baha'i religion. So and I have some couple of questions. Thank you. Yes, those are that's a lot of questions, but it's like really important and really gets at the heart of what we were talking about today. Um, 
so I, I guess your overall question is how how do we assess the claims that many people make? Because there are also in every holy book, we're warned that there are false prophets as well. And not everybody who comes and says that they are a prophet of God is actually one. Um, so like I said, we, we need to investigate for ourselves. Um, and there are, there are, there's a lot more guidance in the holy books than, than we might think. And there are a lot of references made to specific things that these manifestations of God have to fulfill. And, you know, without going into too much detail, Baha'u'llah has fulfilled these prophecies, every single one of them. And they're very specific. These aren't like just th things that could happen coincidentally or, you know, by accident. Um, and in, in terms of, you know, Muslims saying that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets and it, well, then if, does that mean he's the last prophet? But Baha'is are saying there's more, um, you know, the, the phrase seal of the prophets. So first of all, backing up, Abdul Baha says that most holy books use metaphors. Okay. When, the, you know, it says, you know, the lamb or, or it makes any, any references to, you know, nature or animals or or anything like that most of the time humanity is taught through metaphors so a lot of the things we can't if we like literally translated it it wouldn't make sense right and it also contradicts science and in the, in the paris talk i read by abdul baha he says no one truth can contradict truth and science has to be accepted so a lot of these you know things that are written in holy books if taken literally would genuinely just contradict scientific principles so keeping that in mind then we have to uh, interpret things according to what the metaphor is implying. So seal of the prophets could mean a lot of things, but one of the things that Baha'is and that Baha'u'llah has said is that, that there was a whole period of time in religious history when the messengers of God came to prophesy and to foretell future manifestations of God. Their whole purpose was to prepare humanity for the coming of someone after that. And not only that, but every past religion has referred to this one promised one. Not only refer to someone after them, but refer to someone who's coming to fulfill all those prophecies to this great day of peace and prosperity on earth. And so Baha'u'llah claims and, and Baha'is believe that he is the fulfillment of these prophecies. And so therefore, this whole cycle of, of prophethood, of prophesizing this, this promised day has ended. And, and that that cycle has ended. So in, in one sense, you could say Muhammad is the seal of the prophets because he is the last prophet um, out of that series that is foretelling the promised one, right? Because Baha'u'llah does, of course, reference that there will be another manifestation of God after 1,000 years, but that's not the focus of his revelation. The focus of his revelation is to fulfill all these things people have been waiting for for thousands of years and bringing unity to the world because that was never a focus of past religions, and rightly so, because humanity was not at all ready to be united on a global context, and it wasn't even possible. But today we see it is possible. It's It hasn't happened yet, but it's definitely possible. And so that's just one answer to your question. Of course, there's a lot more to get into with all these different prophecies, but I encourage you to keep investigating and studying on your own. So do we have any other questions? Okay, well, if not, then I want to thank Peona again for her talk. I think everyone enjoyed it. These questions in the chat and um, they just really deepened all of our understandings, especially for me at least. So um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this presentation. So um, uh, now I'll introduce our speaker for next week. Our speaker next week is Dr. Michael Carlberg and his topic is competition or cooperation of a high perspective. And again, these talks occur every Saturday at noon Eastern Standard Time, uh, Eastern Daylight Time, actually. So uh, please invite your friends and family. And again, if you're new to the Baha'i Faith or if you'd like to be added to our mailing list, uh, please fill out the Google form that we will put in the chat below. And now we're just going to close with a Baha'i song.
Have a great week, everyone. Hope to see you all next Saturday. Bye.